It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is David Ross. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Larry Lasseur of the CBS television news staff and Lewis Banks, associate editor of Time magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dean Rusk, president of the Rockefeller Foundation and former assistant secretary of state. The Rockefeller Foundation and the General Education Board are, of course, outstanding among the tax-exempt educational foundations of this country. Well, they're now under attack by a special committee of the House and charged with financing, among other things, projects which are incompatible with our Constitution. Well, our guest tonight, the former Assistant Secretary of State, is president of both foundations. So we'd like to ask Dean Rusk, first to tell us something about the original concepts under which these foundations were originated. Well, Mr. Lassar, when Mr. Rockefeller Sr. was a small boy, he began the habit of giving. And as his income increased, his giving increased. There came a time when he decided that uh, his giving had grown too large for management by a single individual, and he began to establish uh, large endowed institutions. One of the first was the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, which is still in existence over on the East River and doing a fine job in medical research. He then created the General Education Board for the promotion of education in the United States uh, without regard to race or sex or religion. Uh, and then in 1913, he established the Rockefeller Foundation for the very broad purpose of promoting the well-being of mankind throughout the world. Well, Dean, do you think that in the past half century, the uh, successive presidents and their paid staffs have carried out the concepts of the founders? Well, I think there's no doubt, uh, Larry, that um, the boards uh, have carried out the wishes of the founder. Of course, the charter purposes are very broad. It's hard to think of many things that might not contribute to the well-being of mankind in the judgment of a group of trustees. If, you, uh, if your question means, uh, have they always made exactly the right decisions, that is a matter to be determined from the record. People's judgment will differ. We think the record is a good one. Well, Mr. Russ, <coughs> one of the charges that was made was that the uh, control of foundations has gotten away from the trustees into a kind of career civil service. Do you think that this control has passed from the trustees and, and that decisions are being made by staff without reference to these trustees as a foundation? That may vary from organization to organization. In our case, it has not. Uh, the trustees of the Rockefeller Foundation make all grants uh, more than $10,000 in amount. And they appropriate the funds and establish the policies for grants of less than $10,000. These proposals are brought to them in trustee meetings at which there is fine attendance uh, and are presented by the officers with all of the background and the arguments for and against and the decisions are made by the boards. Uh, the, the, the problem of serving on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation is one of, uh, uh, of uh, difficulty because it involves time and interest and attention to duty. Well, Mr. Rusk, I guess one of the chief criticisms of the uh, foundations is that they're tax exempt. Now, were they always tax exempt under an act of Congress when they started? Uh, organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation uh, have been tax exempt from the beginning. It's been one of the long established traditions of our Anglo-American jurisprudence to uh, allow tax exemption to charitable organizations of this type. The uh, founding fathers brought that tradition with them when this country was established and the state legislatures and the Congress have held to it right along. Do you think this type of foundation is now kind of a permanent part of our system? Or do you think eventually you run out of things to do because of competition from agencies like the National Science Foundation, United Nations, and all those competitive agencies? Will you have anything left to do? I think competition is not quite the right word, Mr. Banks, because there is plenty to do in the field of, uh, of uh, a foundation and charitable activity. It is quite true that uh, there was a time when there were a few large foundations with a pretty wide open field without too many working in it. But, and in these later days, with uh, uh, governments and international organizations and large numbers of foundations and corporations coming into the field, uh, it is true that you have to be somewhat more aware of what other people are doing if you are going to get the most for your own money. And I think that's the, that's the uh, more important point rather than that of competition. Mr. I think Rose, charity is here to stay. How much uh, favoritism is shown among foundations? Is, are there gifts to uh, friends or to special alma maters or to, uh, is there any uh, political uh, 
discrimination practiced? I would be surprised to find that there was any political discrimination. Uh, there are some foundations that are created to support one or two or three specific institutions, and that's the whole purpose for which they were established. As far as our two foundations are concerned, I suppose that we have made grants to over a thousand separate institutions in the United States scattered throughout uh, almost all of the 48 states. And I think the national foundations could not properly be charged with favoritism. Larry mentioned the uh, congressional hearings. I wonder if you think that there's sufficient freedom from political pressure or corporation pressure or business pressure for foundations to make decisions and to go along on lines of bold research which are necessary if they're to pay their way. <clears throat> I think that uh, freedom is one of the things that foundations will fight for. And one of the uh, uh, issues involved in the course of investigation over the past two years is whether the foundations are to retain the freedom which they have always had. Uh, we believe that they will be allowed that freedom because the uh, necessity for it has been demonstrated over and over again, and we have no doubt that the Congress uh, is going to continue its policy in that regard. Well, Mr. Co uh, Mr. Russ, the Congress in these uh, Reese Committee public hearings has charged the foundations with everything from aiding and abetting uh, communism in the schools with uh, violation of the antitrust laws. Now, do you intend to defend yourself on all these points or to uh, set out the ones in which you feel you do best at? Well, we filed a reply with the uh, Reese Committee uh, recently in which we tried to deal with as many of these uh, charges as we could. Uh, actually, we did not speak specifically to every one of the many that were brought up because we just could not believe that the committee itself took these charges seriously. And we made the point in our reply that if we fail to speak to any point which the committee might take seriously, we didn't concede the point, we would like an opportunity to come back to it later. But uh, we, uh, we tried to cover most of those in our reply. They complained you back Dr. Kinsey, too. Yes, we uh, put some money into uh, Dr. Kinsey through the National Research Council's uh, Committee on Research in Problems of Sex. That's a, pr uh, a program that has been going for uh, oh, about 30 years now, more than 30 years. Uh, and uh, in its overall uh, reach, it has had uh, very important results to uh, medicine and to the well-being of mankind. Uh, it's that committee, for example, which has led to the discoveries of sex hormones and many other uh, factors which have made a great difference to the uh, health and stability of our people. Well, Mr. Rusk, what about the charge of the committee that the tax exemption of the foundations isn't fair to the government because if they weren't tax exempt, 90% of the uh, money they take in would go to the government, which the government could spend as it pleases? Well, I think that uh, has several elements in it. In the first place, uh, government has systematically pursued the policy of encouraging philanthropy and encouraging charity. And it would not be fair to suppose that uh, government is being cheated in some way if people do what government has encouraged them to do. Also, I think the dollar amounts have been uh, greatly exaggerated here. Uh, it isn't true to say that 90% of the foundation uh, capital in the country uh, really belongs to the government because it might otherwise have been taxed. Uh, in the, when the Rockefeller Foundation was established, the tax factor was negligible. If we were a business corporation today paying taxes as any other corporation, our taxes would be about 5% of our income, not 90 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, in any event, uh, uh, we uh, believe that when the Congress uh, announces a policy of encouraging charity and philanthropy and people respond to it, that is a perfectly proper action on their part. I what about these charges, though, sir, that uh, some of the new free, tax-free foundations are really do do dodging organizations? It is true, I think, that the number of foundations has been increasing, and not all of them, perhaps, are quite as good as some of the big foundations. Well, there may be some uh, activities around the fringe of the foundation field that would cause real concern. I think the Commissioner of Internal Revenue testified before the Reese Committee, or perhaps it was his assistant who so testified, that in the two-year period, 1951-53, tax exemption was withdrawn from something like 55 organizations who did not qualify under the tax exemption legislation uh, as, the, as interpreted by the, by the Internal Revenue Service. Certainly, the established foundations have an interest in seeing to it that um, there is no racketeering in this field. This is an important social organization that ought to be protected against abuse, and the policies of the Congress ought to be protected against abuse. That is one of the reasons why we were very anxious uh, to see that uh, foundations make public reporting of their, on their activities. Well, how much uh, do you <coughs> think every foundation should report to the public? Do you think these reports should be elaborated and uh, a, a clear view given of uh, just what this money is uh, donated to? 
Well, we uh, are inclined to believe that uh, Mr. Alfred Sloan made a wise remark when he said that foundations ought to act with uh, glass pockets. The public ought to know what they do with their money, how they invest it, how they spend it, in order that the public can be assured that the tax exemption privilege is not being abused. We have undertaken from the earliest days of the Rockefeller Foundation and General Education Board uh, to report fully to the uh, public on what we do. Uh, we think it would be burdensome if every foundation were required to report as elaborately as we do. But within the limits of the size and activities of a foundation, we feel quite strongly that they should make their activities public. And we supported, uh, we were inclined to support uh, legislation introduced by two members of the Cox Committee, which would require that of tax-exempt organizations. Well, Mr. Ross, do you think that the foundation should be responsible for the uh, reports or for the people to whom they give these grants, or should this be uh, entirely out of their hands, supposing someone turns up whose views are incompatible with the government's? Well, we uh, do not believe that uh, those who grant money to scholars and scientists should exercise a, an intellectual surveillance over the work of those scientists and scholars. In the first place, no scientist or scholar of character would uh, receive any money under those conditions. And uh, freedom is the essence of scholarship. And when you make a grant to a scientist or a scholar, what, you're, what you want from him is his uninhibited thinking on the problem which he has attacked. Now, if you were going to prescribe your answer for him in advance, there's no particular reason to make him a grant or let him make the study. I see. Well, thank so, you very much, Dean Ruskin. It's a great privilege to have you here tonight. Thank you. The opinions expressed on the Longine Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Louis Banks. Our distinguished guest was Dean Rusk, president of the Rockefeller Foundation and former assistant secretary of state. What does the name Longines mean to you? Well, it means a watch, to be sure. But much more, the name Longines on the dial of a watch means that here is one of the finest of all the world's watches. The movement in every Longines watch is regarded everywhere as exceptionally fine. Every part is exquisitely finished for greater accuracy and long life for better timekeeping and complete dependability. Yes, the name Longines on a watch means something very fine. It spells the utmost in satisfaction, confidence, and pride of ownership. The name Longines identifies what is, in fact, the world's most honored watch, the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And wonderful as it may seem, you may buy and own or proudly give the world's most honored watch, Longines, for as little as $71.50. And remember, if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you are paying the price of a Longines. So why not insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is David Ross, speaking for Vacationing Frank Knight, and reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor. <laughs>